and you can start. So, hello, welcome to the presentation about uh, print care work and the challenges with developing a local string buffer. My name is uh, Petr Mladek. Uh, I'm kernel developer in SUSE Labs, focusing on print K and live patching and, and some other things. Uh, okay, so what will be this presentation about? I will first start with a quick summary of the print K problems and how the rework is supposed to fix this. Uh, then I will continue with the story uh, how the local and buffer have been uh, developed and why it took so long. Then I will uh, have some section about atomic operations and common sense, uh, which will, was basically my approach because I don't feel to be expert and uh, I actually learned this hard way that it's not easy. And I have the one example where I'm actually still not sure why it's this way. And then there will be summary about my experience uh, and finally question and answers. But uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time. And especially I'm looking for input in the third section about the atomic operations because I might even though there are some nonsenses and it will be great if you could fix me. So let's start with the first uh, section about print care work. So first about print care problems. I will try to be quick because I uh, explained this uh, deeply last year on the conference, and I guess that most of you have been there. So uh, just in case, so I would split the print K problems into three areas that print K could cause deadlocks, soft and live lockups, and uh, also some messages might get lost. So uh, the deadlocks, are caused by, of course, logs. There are several logs involved. Uh, the one is guarding the uh, log buffer. It's uh, currently mostly solved by, by redirecting the output, the nested print case to per CPU buffers. But uh, it's still, it's not ideal because uh, these messages might get lost. And also we still, it doesn't solve panic uh, situation where we need to access the main log buffer and uh, since the uh, per CPU buffers and so on. Then there is the console semaphore or console related logs. Console semaphore, it's a, uh, it uh, doesn't cause, uh, it, it's not that problematic on its own. The problem is that it's actually sleeping log and that the current owner of printk is responsible for uh, flushing all messages to console. And also this uh, semaphore is used also in some other location, locations, so there really might be some waiting processes. So when the current printk comes, for example, from uh, scheduler and it called you could, would call this, take this semaphore, then when releasing it, that it might need to wake up processes. It means calling scheduler code again, and it might cause deadlocks by the uh, scheduler logs. Similar problem is also with the another uh, logs used by uh, particular consoles. These are mostly like uh, port log for the related devices and some other, eventually there are some other logs. This is uh, currently being solved by using print k effort on these locations where the where this nested, uh, call, when actually uh, print k is called with some of these logs uh, taken, but it's hard to maintain because it's easy to forget and 
even though money know that this print case actually is in, in this part and should be print k different and also uh, another problem is that actually flushing this uh, uh, messages to console happens in interrupt context which is atomics and it's not ideal so and it's actually the other problem with soft and live lockups and and it's related to flushing uh, messages to the console and the current and the, the current owner of the semaphore is responsible for flushing all messages uh, and it might take quite a lot of time and with the uh, num increasing number of cpus and increasing complexity and uh, increasing number of debugging messages uh, the chance of ending in soft lockup situation is much higher and definitely this is not uh, usable for real-time kernel. The current solution is some hack that Sprintk tries to steal the semaphore but it's sleeping clock so it can't wait always and uh, it's, it's not reliable and it uh, doesn't fully solve the problem. Uh, so it will be solved another way. And finally, missing messages. This is obvious. It's caused by slow consoles and limited buffers and temporary buffers. That some messages might get lost. Okay. So now uh, go to the rework. Uh, first part is uh, switching to fully lockless ring buffer. It would solve problem with deadlocks cause the lock buffer lock and will help to remove the temporary buffers and it will actually make sure that all messages will be stored uh, always on single place so we could find them in cache dump or even when the lock is in some permanent memory of some uh, non-volatile RAM, then it might be possible to actually find them even after reboot. Uh, so this is one step, and the other big step are per, per console k-threads. So we will uh, uh, offload the console work to this uh, k-threads. It would basically, it should basically solve all dead logs with console related logs and also soft lockups and live, lock, live lockups of course there is uh, it will bring another problem that actually blocked this for years and uh, that uh, there are situations when this uh, uh, k-thread won't be scheduled and we actually will not see messages on, on consoles one proposed solution is to introduce uh, atomic consoles. There is uh, already code for uh, lockless, uh, the classic uh, serial console, the ward one. And so it might be used to, uh, to show emergency messages in some critical situations. Unfortunately, it's uh, all uh, consoles uh, can be uh, converted to some lockless variants and also it might take a lot of time up when at, le at least the one that could be converted are converted so there are plans to use some uh, some uh, lock uh, special lock that might be taken uh, nest uh, that would allow nested uh, locking on single CPU to actually somehow synchronized even this uh, other consoles and at least somehow detect when it's safe or not to, to use them. But it it's still have to be investigated. And it's actually the uh, next big task. So, no about developing the lockless ring buffer. Well, actually we need uh, one. So the reason for the fully lockless is because it's the only solution for all these uh, uh, problems in panic where there are a lot of hacks and so on. 
And uh, there was actually a possibility to use F-trace uh, local link buffer, but it, we decided not to do it. Uh, it's, uh, it was actually developed uh, with focus on write performance and it has quite bad support for uh, readers. It's actually uh, implemented as a per CPU list of pages and the reader always have to take the page uh, from the list. So it completely disappears uh, for writers. Actually has to do it on all CPUs and treat uh, the message there and then sort uh, the messages from all CPUs by timestamps and then put the pages back and take another one and so on. So it might be pretty complicated to get support for more readers that are needed by uh, PrintK. And also uh, PrintK is basically a slow path. Uh, so we don't have to, doesn't have to be that optimized. And so Peter Zalstra <laughs> said that actually it might be much easier to write this code. And I'm actually not sure if the result is much easier, but but uh, yeah, we, we have it. And it's ready for uh, the next match window. Okay, so how the development look like? Uh, it started two years and a half ago when John Ogden uh, started to study print K code and history and has started to play with the rework. John Agnes is actually, uh, he works for the company that is owned by uh, Thomas Gleixner. And actually he is responsible for making the upstream kernel ready uh, for uh, uh, print K in upstream ready for a uh, real time. And it's, it's great that it has been done by this company because uh, they uh, don't want to do hacks and they actually want to solve the trouble and it will help even others that are struggling with, with these problems, even in a non-real-time kernel. And uh, John Ognes really put a lot of, lot of effort and thanks to him we have what we have now. And okay. So it actually took him one year and until he sent first uh, uh, proof of concept or first uh, pitch set, it was actually a complete rework that actually worked and was uh, used since then in the RT pitch set, but it was not good enough for upstream because it was not fully, the ring buffer was not fully lockless, it used some special lock and also the solving of the consoles there were some problems that uh, would need more discussions and so on so uh, we decided actually uh, go for the to focus on the fully lockless ring buffer first which was the next uh, patch set it uh, took uh, John four months to actually uh, came with it, and it was really much more complicated as he warned me. Actually, there were uh, there were two ring buffers: one for the data for the uh, strings, and the other one for metadata, which is actually nice because uh, then you could just see the strings, uh, and they are not interrupted by some. Uh, strange data and also it was needed for the lockless algorithm algorithms because the metadata includes some information that had to be checked atomically by comparing exchange and you could not have it in a buffer where you have uh, randomly sized uh, strings random data so the metadata could be on the same place when in the next wrap might be random uh, data so it's basically impossible to do this so uh, this atomic variables have to be on a well-known well-known location location and uh, unfortunately it was a bit more complicated because actually the metadata in the desk ring were sorted by list 
which was another complication of understanding how it works. And there were a lot of variables that had to be manipulated locally, and it was hard to see the state of actually each record and prove that we read the variables correctly with right barriers and so on. So, and uh, when I uh, when he said this, then I have been uh, after vacation fresh and I was looking at it with fresh mind. Uh, so I actually got some ideas how to make it uh, easier. And actually I started to play with some alternative solution and I always met some problem and so I looked and how it was solved in John's uh, page set which actually helped me to understand how he uh, how uh, actually uh, it it works the original page set and so at the end it was actually possible I will look at it more on the next slide and anyway, I spent like three weeks on it, uh, like really busy weeks, and I had headaches for two months after that, and I haven't had this any time before, so it seems that barriers really could cause headaches. So it's not just a joke. Okay, so what were the interesting tricks uh, that we used, and most of them are actually for jo from John. Uh, already from the original bed set. Uh, he used, uh, instead of uh, storing indexes or working with uh, indexes to the arrays, uh, to the ring buffers, we actually, uh, we actually work with uh, logical positions, which uh, means that we don't stop at the last index and we just count later. The arrays is, size is power of two and we could get the index by just masking out the higher bits. And it helps a lot to solve troubles with wrapping and reusing the same location again and again, and actually to prevent some races and so on. Another trick is, or maybe it's obvious that we actually have few states, like that we reserve uh, the writer reserve space, and then it writes the, the data, and then he changed the state of this record to committed. It means that it's consist in consistent state. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and finally, when uh, there is no longer space, then we have to rewrite the oldest uh, messages. So we actually have to make this record reusable and uh, use it again. And I actually see that uh, Hannes writes that there still might be overflows when, when, when this type of overflows. Yes, uh, this can happen well, uh, but it's almost impossible. And especially uh, there are some other aspects that will prevent it or make it almost impossible when these logical positions uh, wrap. Uh, one thing is that we actually store their uh, sequence number, which is uh, a 64 bit value, and it basically should never uh, overflow in, in a reasonable time. Stamp, uh, time. But uh, anyway, uh, and uh, one of the things that also prevent some wild uh, reusing of that state is that by design always the first record uh, in, in the first valid record in the ring has to be in committed state. It's it's needed for, for the reader API to make it uh, lockless and it actually even helps some wild over, uh, over wrapping. Uh, when uh, one of the record is being modified and uh, so on. So uh, that's it. And so uh, my ideas actually were uh, that we uh, put together the logical position and the state bits into one atomic variable. So it got uh, 
this, it was easier to define the state each time um, without comparing to money values and uh, it, the state was clear. It can be manipulated. Uh, sorry, it can be manipulated by a compare exchange, which is for barrier, which makes uh, also uh, checking the validity much easier. And I actually had there even for state, which was maybe even in the original uh, approach, but it was more visible in, 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 the, in the proof of concept that actually we always uh, expected some logical position when we were writing, because it was either this rep, next rep, or previous rep, or also the re readers expected some uh, position. So if uh, we read the metadata and the logical position was different, that we actually knew that it has been reused and it was some little state like missed. So these are the tricks and uh, some other tricks are like uh, to make uh, the code easier. We use the fact that print case low path. So we uh, heavily used uh, comparing change as a full barrier and read the metadata like uh, with reading state, reading metadata and reading state. And when it was valid uh, before and after, then the metadata were valid. And when reading the data, then we read it valid metadata and then read the strings actually, and then read it the metadata again. So it was kind of, uh, there are probably more barriers that are really needed, but uh, the code is just uh, easy to, much easier to uh, prove that it's correct. Yeah. So that is about the tricks. And uh, what other really helped was uh, Plumbers Conference in 2019. Uh, we met there, uh, I met there with John and we uh, spent a lot of time talking about this uh, exchanging ideas. And also another important thing was that Tomat Leisner organized a discussion with uh, Linus, uh, Peter Zaustra and some others uh, people that were there and you know, were interested. And so we came up with basically some agreement on, on some stuff and uh, even had basically, uh, we know that we have a chance to actually get it upstream. Uh, so uh, for example, we decided to really use the uh, a lo fully lockless ring buffer and my approach, which was slightly less effective, but uh, it was easier to review. And that we will finally be able to try offload to the K threads. That it's actually needed to, to remove this, uh, to make it uh, more reliable or solve some big troubles. And, uh, but it was agreed that it's the, uh, the messages has to be uh, stored in records, which means like uh, uh, the entire line together or the pieces of the continuous lines, like one piece uh, together, because people are used to the less mess output and people would complain when we regress. Uh, there was the idea to re remove dictionary, which was some extra metadata by devprint k. Uh, yeah, and as Hennes uh, say that it actually, they will stay because we later found, uh, found that uh, not only that some people are using them and even like uh, journal uh, CTL from system D has support to actually use this metadata and uh, show some useful information. Uh, more useful information for, for, from the logs. And as the main rule is not to break user space, then the dictionaries have to stay. Uh, but it seems that just we will store them a bit different way, but it still have to be done. Okay, so, and then it was getting uh, easier. We knew what we wanted. 
but it still took like uh, four and five uh, half months until uh, John sent like some cleaner implementation of my proof of concept. I saw some uh, in, uh, some uh, versions in the meantime, and we discussed them. But uh, this was the time when we wanted to get some input from other people because we were not sure about some barriers and so on. And actually, I spent like three weeks again deeply reviewing uh, the design and the barriers and. By chance, I got sick for another two and a half months. Um, I my uh, hands were so aching, so I was not able to work. And I I am not sure if it was related or not, but it seemed that uh, working on uh, localized algorithms is really dangerous. Uh, yeah, but anyway, this was like the big discussion and it took another three months until uh, and actually it was also related to my sickness uh, three months uh, until john provided another cleaner solution and then we discussed another things and finally paul mckinney act uh, that the barriers made sense and we fixed a few more details and pushed it into maintainer tree it was before a 5.9 match window, but we decided to skip it because we expected some more changes of the format because of continuous lines. And we didn't want to make uh, crash them tools to support that many formats because it would be pain. And also it was good to have some more testing in Linux next, which actually found some, some troubles. And actually, the per count lines uh, have to stay because uh, people just want it, and even Linus uh, like pushed us to keep it. And so, first idea to make it the easy way to actually concat con uh, concatenate the messages on the reader side, but unfortunately, each of these pieces had its had its own sequence number. And this sequence number was part of the design of the lockless uh, algorithm. So it, there was no easy way how to have uh, like uh, the same sequence number for different records in the lockless buffer. Uh, and then uh, journal settler from system uh, reported missed lines when sec some sequence numbers of the concatenated pieces uh, were lost. So, and it was again when I was after vacation and fresh and so on. So I again explained with some uh, lockless uh, tricks and came with some proof of concept how to reopen uh, the last record that was already committed. And it's actually used in the end. It fortunately, it worked and John uh, finalized it. And we actually even clean up the handling of the states in the code. So it's even helped to make the code cleaner. So it, I, I, I'm happy with, with the result. And it's in the maintainer tree. It's already, I, I'm going to send this, uh, make pull request with this the following week. So let's see. It still uh, will not be like a fully lockless because we still have to have there that. Uh, ring buffer log because it's used also for few other and other things and we still have to uh, decide how, how to uh, how to solve them and it, this solution was not ready for it will not be ready for for the next match window but i think that it's good that actually the most complicated algorithms will be there and eventual races will be solved later Oh, sorry. Do you see all all lines? No, at the moment you need to uh, zoom out a bit more. Because I, I'm trying to zoom, and it doesn't work. Oh. Down. 
Oh, it doesn't work. I have like 100% and it's not. Uh, try to switch the page if it resets back. Oh, hmm. There's some problem. Great. I'll try to hide the presentation. Hmm. Oh, okay. So something happened. Okay. Okay. Oh. oh. So it, it's somehow somehow bound bound to you because oh, it looks like. But I'm not sure what I did. Bit to page. Ah, okay. It's not, I know. I, I clicked uh, somewhere on, on that line. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, so that's uh, about the log buffer. And now uh, another uh, section about the atomic operations. So uh, I I think that. I am not like full, completely new by to barriers. I have some experience with uh, uh, lockless operations. If in live pitching code, I read some papers uh, from Paul McKinney on LWN, uh, and also I tried to read that uh, memory barriers document in kernel documentation. But well, I, honestly, I don't understand everything, and I know it so. I try to follow just some basic rules that I hope that make sense. And please uh, fix me if I sell, uh, tell some something, some complete nonsense. So uh, one basic is that actually write barrier should be always paired with read barrier. I'm a bit uh, confused why the documentation says that when it's one barrier is missing, that it's almost centrally wrong. I actually not sure when when it actually could be correct, but I know that some barriers are implicit, and so, so I know if it's mean by this, or maybe if we just are writing to some special registers in CPU or something like this, then maybe just the right barrier might be enough, or when we are reading from there, then we just need read barrier. I, I don't know what's mean by this uh, almost. Anyway, if you use bold, bold uh, then uh, you are you should be uh, on the safe side, but only if, of course, when you actually use the right barrier on the right location, and if you, you if you have enough barriers when they are needed. OK, so another basic is that you have to use uh, atomic variables when you want to uh, modify some uh, value atomic way. It prevents uh, compiler optimizations and problems with alignment when uh, the CPU even might need to uh, do the read uh, twice or something like this, or fetch the memory twice or into operations. Uh, and uh, yeah, and there are that read once, write once macros that basically just prevent compiler optimizations. They don't provide any barriers or anything, but they are really needed in some to prevent some optimizations. For example, in, uh, when we are cycling and want to make sure that uh, the values read in every cycle. Uh, then compare exchange is full barrier, which might make life easier, but there are of course also uh, relaxed variants, which are more tricky and are used in, in uh, some blocking uh, APs uh, that will need to be more effective and, and, and so on. And always it's really important to always comment barriers what's synchronized and why. And actually, uh, John uh, Agnes came up with uh, some 
official format for documenting memory barriers. It starts with some human-friendly description of what, what's uh, being uh, synchronized and why. And then there is some uh, notation, which is might be useful for litmus tests. And the, the beginning important piece is this comment. It's uh, added for each operation that has to be synchronized when some variable is manipulated and like this is just prefix to make this that to make clear that this is uh, just the command for, for, for this notation and then there is function name and some letter because there might be more location in the same function and then you describe when you modify some values and you do, do read or write operations and some another values, then these two operations rely on these barriers between uh, these operations. Yeah. And uh, so uh, my, 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 my problem with this is that uh, it might be much harder to uh, keep up to date when the code is being modified. I, I prefer this human friendly text, but I understand that this, this might be quite useful as well. And by honestly, I didn't read this sections that much myself. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. I, I think that you don't have to use it, but just if you want, then this might be uh possibility okay and now what was actually the situation which made me really nervous about my uh, that my common sense is not good enough to actually review this patch set fortunately this code is not longer in in that final code so i am more confident that uh, the final version is actually correct I would be more nervous if this code is still there. But, okay, so I tried to reduce it really a lot. It was part of a huge, huge patch. And actually the memory barriers I are far away from each other. And I tried to minimize the code and I'm not sure if I did it correctly, but uh, well, I, I, honestly, I not completely understood the problem, but uh, well, we, we will see. One function is when we are trying to store message. So we first have to uh, reserve space for it, which means if there is not enough space, we have to push tail, like uh, get rid of some oldest record. And when there is finally space, then we try to push head. And when we succeed, then we actually reserve space. and. Let's ignore now that, that this compare exchange is actually full barrier. In the original code, there was a compare exchange relax, and I want, wanted to keep this uh, full. Like the discussion was about this white barrier because John actually used full barrier here, and I ask why because uh, the intention was when you reserve the space, then you have to make sure that everyone see actually the new tail and new head before you start writing anything into the reserved space, metadata and data. Okay, and then we have in the reader a function that want to get a first sequence number from the first from the oldest record. And it's actually stored in the metadata. And it starts with reading the tail logical position. Then there is three barrier. It's not that important for this uh, problem. Reads the data, and if they are valid, then the sequence number is what we wanted. But uh, if this fails, if the data are not valid, then we actually have to read the tail again. And we actually know by design that uh, it has has to have change because uh, when we are actually uh, 
this reservation is more complicated. We actually make sure that the uh, when we are pushing the tail, we actually make sure that the next uh, position always points to valid, valid data. And so we actually could do this in Visiloop, and we do a barrier to make sure that uh, actually we read updated tail in the next iteration. And now, uh, John tried to uh, show me this uh, Litmus, uh, Litmus code. I don't know how much you are familiar. I, I'm not that familiar with Litmus test, but I, I hope that it will be good enough, like uh, understandable for you. Like there is one function running, for example, on one CPU that writes the tile and it's, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, it, it means that is one CPU that is pushing this tile. Uh, pushing this tile to make space. Then uh, another CPU is reading the tail and it actually see that there is a space. Let's ignore that he also is pushing head and it's writing data. And there is like write barrier to make sure that uh, actually before we write the data, then uh, the previous information are supposed to be written. And now there is another uh, CPU that actually read the data, which is uh, related to this uh, read of the data. And uh, then it actually realized that the data are not valid. So it does the read memory barrier and tries to read, read the tail again. And now we are, look, this litmus test is checking if there is a situation when the tile uh, is still the original value, but this CPU already see updated data. That actually, it sees the updated data that looks invalid. So it, it's supposed to read like updated tail. And if we run this test, uh, then we actually see that it might happen. There is a situation when this really happened. And if you just replace this right barrier with full barrier and nothing else, no other change, change then suddenly the possibility is gone and the race never happened. So I try to uh, show this how it might look like on the CPUs. So one CPU is writing the tail, another CPU is reading the tail, and if there is like if it's uh, set, then it writes the data after white barrier. And on CPU two, uh, uh, the, the other CPU is reading data, and after it barrier reads the tail. And if by chance, if this uh, actually tail is already updated even without barrier, and also these functions uh, see the updated data even without barrier, and if this could see the original tail, it might mean that it's actually this right barrier didn't synchronize what it was done by the CPU. And so it means I'm not sure how the right barriers are supposed to work. Uh, like John told me that actually we need full barrier to make sure that what sees uh, CPU one in this, uh, when it does the decision, then the read barrier makes sure that it's the same thing that is can be seen by all other CPUs. And the write barrier actually makes sure that uh, also the writes happen. So the full barrier really solve this problem and prevent the situation. I don't know if anyone could confirm this or have some explanation. 
It seems that there is some uh, wild discussion on the RSC chat. Hey, yeah, that, but it's mostly about the uh, barriers and memory consistency and uh, similar topics and uh, not directly related to your talk, so I didn't bother you. Yeah. So, so for me, it's and if anyone could confirm that this somehow makes sense and that this full barrier really solves something, or if it's some problems in the in the litmus and in the memory model that it's using, I, I believe that it's not because um, it really has to solve the problem. Yeah, uh, I don't uh, know. Yeah. I, I would say that this code is completely strange. Like we are just reading here and writing, and having their write barrier is strange. But on the other hand, I always thought that write barrier actually synchronized all CPUs, so it was supposed to also synchronize what's happening here. But maybe it's not. Maybe it has to be really full barrier to make sure that actually. Also, what's seen on all CPUs, it's also what's read and write written there. I don't know. I mean, there is no barrier in CPU one, in CPU zero. So, um, why should it be? Why should it care? Or anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I uh, understand oh, what. Right. So the, the tail here. Update. So right, no, no. Meaning, and and see, there is here. There's there's no no barrier. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. On CPU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which means it can update things, but whether this update is mirrored to CPU one or CPU two is anyone's guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which means yeah. that whatever CPU one sees here could be that, or could be the previous one. You don't know. Yeah. But exactly. Just make sure, in my view, that basically whenever the CPU two sees already updated T, then in all such cases it also sees updated D. But it can also, of course, always see the stale value of T. But then it, of course, sees also stale value of D. That's really the purpose of the of these two barriers uh, being coupled together. I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. So this like like the couple uh, the full barrier means that the other CPUs will see exactly the same what sees the CPU one after that or the previous state but also consistent so it can see yeah. the CPU two can see old value of T but then it yeah. guarantees that we'll also see the old value of D okay 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 but is there the right barrier on CPU one really useful anyway like the t is a like control flow dependency on cpu one yeah because we branch based on t so like the read of tail on cpu one creates a control flow dependency for the store into data so i don't actually think that the write barrier there like has any practical impact yeah actually what if you put like uh, full barrier here, then it will make sure that. Yeah, that if you put there a full barrier, then that makes some kind of sense. Uh, yeah, like yeah. that would at least have some effect, although I'm not sure it's still necessary because like the control dependency seems to order the load and store anyway. Yeah. As far as I understand, although with the speculation, well, yeah. <laughs> one is never sure. <laughs> I would think that actually it, it's needed because otherwise I couldn't imagine that removing this barrier would make this. But yeah, it couldn't make this work. And we want to uh, make sure that this ordering works. And this actually this is what happening in the in the code that one CPU is making space and the other CPU is just using the space and the reserve for itself. So one CPU is pushing the tail again and again, and other CPU are stealing <laughs> the space for themselves. And the readers have to have to steal, see the updated state 
when when the successful writer that reserved the place actually the place that writing the data. The very way that you see that actually uh, the data are not no longer all valid. Okay, so that's it. Uh, this slide is just, I, I uh, use the same uh, CPU uh, story with the original code, but it's not that important. So, and now just the summary. Uh, from my uh, point of view, if you could avoid lockless algorithms, then avoid them when possible and just use locking because it saves a lot of pain. Uh, if you have to use slockless algorithms, then just to try uh, put more values together so that you could change the state atomically and have less values that variables that you actually have to synchronize by barriers and so on. Then be aware that common sense is not uh, enough. You might get better with experience and reading articles and so on, but it's just a hard problem and uh, it's good to get a review from some more experienced people. I guess that the litmus test might help. I'm just not like sure how to create. Actually, litmus tests usually are like small piece of code. So you have to somehow simplify the situation. And I'm not sure if you, when you prove something with litmus test, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that your code is correct. Because if the litmus test is too simplified, then you might still have bug in the code. Always comment. I, I'm not sure if the standardized comments uh, might, uh, people would like them or not, but that is the way. And just warning that, at least for me, it really caused health troubles working on this uh, uh, complicated stuff. So it's not just a joke, at least from my point of view. And at least to me, vacation really helped in two, two cases, actually come up with some interesting ideas. Uh, yeah, so that's my uh, okay. Experience. Thank you. This. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We are seven minutes over already, yeah, yeah, yeah. and there will be another talk. So let's stop the recording now.